Hey friends, memes are the lifeblood of internet culture. They quickly convey concepts and catchphrases that are immediately relatable and shareable. And so as our phones and computers can isolate us from each other, in some odd ways, memes can bring us back together and help us relate. And just like many internet subcultures out there, there have been some great memes made for the music producer subculture, such as the skeleton laying on the mixing desk. I like to think that many of these memes have helped folks empathize with the hard work that each one of us puts into creating computer music, or at least gives us all a nice belly chuckle. But as fun as memes can be, they can also be laughably wrong and leave musicians with a bad take that could make mixing harder because they're reinforcing bad ideas. These misinformation graphics or studio advice memes can oversimplify topics to the degree that whatever insight they meant to originally provide is lost due to the lack of context or in other cases you just get a flat out wrong meme. In this video, we're going to debunk all this uncalled for meme advice and instead try to get at what was likely the original reason these memes were made in the first place. Okay, let's start with one of the most classic of all mixing memes and that is the stereo placement meme. There's probably over a thousand of these out there and while most of them offer some practical mixing information such as you don't want to pan your kick drum all the way to the left or to the right, nothing in mixing is ever absolute. Or in other words, each mix is unique, and you'd be hard pressed to find any two professional mixes that ever feature the exact same panning. Panning is not a rule, it's a tool. So taking a look at the first one, which seems to be the least nonsensical of all of them, here we can see that yeah, the vocals and kick are panned dead center, which is solid advice most of the time, but we can see that the drum overheads are placed far to the left and far to the right of the mix. And I'll tell you right now, most all modern drum mixes do not have overheads that wide ever. In fact, most modern drum mixes rarely have overhead mics that exceed 25% panning to the left or to the right. Panning your overheads this wide will result in the cymbals masking reverb tails and other vital stereo elements in your mix. So this meme gets a solid Batman slap. Okay, now this meme tries to up the ante by giving you both bad panning as well as bad EQ advice. For example, the bass frequencies appear to stop at 180 Hz, and if you watched my last video, bass harmonics above 180 Hz are extremely important if you want the bass to translate well. There's just so much wrong here. Snare drums will sound very bad if all they contain is high mids and presence. It can greatly benefit a snare drum to have a strong fundamental frequency somewhere in the low mids of a mix. And in the background vocals, even though it's useful to remove some treble from them as to not conflict with the main vocal, I'm sorry, but vocals are never going to sound good if you filter everything above 3k. Also, let's just go ahead and listen to a pad Atmos at just 3 to 5k. Here we have, in my humble opinion, the King Wax Stereo Placement meme of all time. First of all, why is dude's head chopped off? He doesn't even have ears. And that's rather obvious because panning your effects all the way to the right is never going to sound good. And I think it's also worth pointing something else out. Commonly beginners tend to pan their hi-hats in their mixes rather far from the center. And every one of these mix memes seems to suggest doing this. Now go ahead and listen to some pro mixes and tell me how common that actually is. Hard panning piercing hi-hats is a great way to make your mix sound fatiguing and obnoxious to listen to. It's just not good advice. Okay, moving on from the stereo placement meme, maybe we shouldn't look at this next meme so our eyes don't bleed, but I'm willing to risk it for the laughs. I think what this meme is trying to do is help you maybe with your kick drum, but the information here is bizarrely specific and formulaic. I'm confused by number one here. Apparently your kick drum sample must be the color red and in circular or square shape. Then we have a squint-worthy EQ curve that will apply to any sample you ever run through it. And then we have multiband saturation because who needs CPU resources? Then we have boost with vintage EQ, punch and sub, where you remake all the punch and sub that you took out of the original sample. Then we have multiband compression where we take the subs back out, but that's optional. Then we have fast comp where we take all the attack out of the sample only to put it back in with the slow comp. And when that doesn't work out, we simply resolve to just using a transient shaper. And finally we use corrective EQ to unscrew up our totally screwed up kick sample. Look, I just gotta say that if you have to edit and process your kick drum this much, you probably just chose a bad kick sample. It probably wasn't red enough. <laughs> but no, seriously, there is this general misconception that there is a specific order of effects and they have to be used in the same order every single time. Effects for the most part are for the treatment of audio to enhance sounds or to fix issues if they're needed. And that brings me to the next optical poison meme, number five. 
Again, we have an absurdly long effect chain with a specific order to each effect. Now, due to how familiar vocal and speech are to the human ear, any lack of clarity in vocals is immediately obvious and sounds generally undesirable. So it actually can be common for vocal effect chains to be longer than other instruments. But this is on a whole new level of no bad stop. First of all, gain staging is not an effect. It's the concept of properly feeding the right signal level to gain-dependent effects. You can learn more about gain staging in this video I made a while back. Now next, if you need significant clip automation or EQ that is surgical, perhaps try to, I don't know, re-record the vocals. Deep EQ cuts introduce phasing issues and an unnatural sound. Okay, commonly a de is useful, but then we have the first compressor, suggesting that you must have multiple compressors, which again isn't always the case. Then tonal EQ goes into the next compressor before saturation and limiting. Nope, you still need to add reverb and delay into the signal chain, not as return tracks. Then we need to slot frequencies apparently because our mix is bad and then volume automation. Phew. All right, now this final pick isn't necessarily a meme, it's an ad, but it kind of is a meme, it memed itself. I intentionally blurred out the name of the company because they don't deserve to be promoted, nor did I want to embarrass them. But this scores a solid quack on the whack scale because the level of no here is at an all-time high. Proven EQ curves? Like, who proved what? This is almost as bad as paying for chords. Almost. Look, there's never a case in which EQ curves can apply to multiple sounds and achieve the same result. Best of all, the tagline is, make faster mixing decisions. What? If you just haphazardly slap random EQ curves on your tracks, you're definitely not gonna have an easier or quicker time mixing. Probably the opposite. You're probably gonna have to try to figure out what went wrong. So what did go wrong? How did we get here to where misinformation reigns in the audio world? Well, mainly it's because back in the day, if you wanted to record music, you needed to go to a studio. And in a studio, you had trained engineering professionals operating the mixing board, the mics, the effects, and they had to be really good at it. Because if they weren't, then the records wouldn't get made. Then the other studio in town would get more clients, and then they would eventually get fired. Now zoom to the present day, every single music producer has godlike access to every tool we could ever need to make insanely amazing music at home. But unfortunately, we've tossed the baby out with the bathwater because we've removed expertise from the equation. And any nitwit with a cracked version of Photoshop can crank out this nonsense and further confuse the masses. Now, to be fair, these mixed memes can offer some benefit to folks who have literally no idea what they're doing. They may try one of these mixed tips out and their mix may immediately sound better. But through that process, they may begin to think to themselves, hey, wow, I'm a natural. I'm a genius at mixing. I understand it all. But this is actually a cognitive trap or a bias called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is essentially the process I just described where someone with limited competence in any field doesn't know what they don't know. Or in other words, they don't know how their skills or competence relates to other folks' skills and competence. One or two successes in any field, especially mixing, doesn't in any way make someone competent in the mixing field. This is why this hilarious meme exists, where noob experts with a cracked version of Ableton can mess around with it for a week and then claim that they are now a skilled mastering engineer. Now usually these mix memes are created by folks who reach here, or the initial peak. Rarely, if ever, are mixed memes created by folks further along the Dunning-Kruger effect because eventually you realize that any worthy pursuit in life is probably much more complicated and complex than can be quickly displayed on a meme and absorbed in seconds. Maybe there's a larger life lesson for society here, I don't know. One way or another, it's really important to realize that it's a serious cognitive jungle out there in internet land, and there's a constant barrage of whack information and completely unchecked nonsense, especially in audio production. We truly live in an intellectual race to the bottom. And so if you're out there doing the spacewalk in La La Land through the bowels of the YouTube Academy, I recommend that you always cross-check anything that you learn and remain ever skeptical of mixed memes, especially ones that claim to always do this or always do that. And so, of course, I'm going to use this opportunity to pitch my own mix meme, but it's actually not a meme. It's in the form of a free webinar where I break down how to create great sounding mixes with very useful and actionable tactics using Ableton Live. So if you'd like a break from the safari you're presently in, come on over and click this link above. I'm sure if you watch this webinar, your mixes will sound better and translate well. And hopefully afterward, you'll experience the joy of my favorite internet meme gif, the Stoked Shack and Cat meme. Anyway, if you've made it this far in this video, thanks. That means a lot to me. And here's your reward. A bonus meme of epic proportions. This is the epitome of genius. 
I'm kidding, but this meme is absolutely hilarious because I can't find anything that's factually wrong with it. On the left, we have the undeniable fact that reverb can make it sound better or worse if you're not careful, and on the right, delay changes how it sounds. Just amazing. And true. Anyway, if you have any mixed memes that you've found that are belly laugh worthy, please post them in the comments. I'm kind of collecting them right now. And if you like this kind of thing, like, comment, subscribe. You know what to do. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.